Uh, okay, why don't we uh, get started? Um, thanks for coming to the talk today. Uh, my name is Dan Green. I'm the VP of Engineering at Scality. Uh, we're a software-defined storage company. Uh, and joining me today is uh, Vianney Rancerel, who is our uh, Director of Research uh, involved in the uh, advanced development topics that we have uh, underway at Scality. Um, today we're going to uh, talk about uh, some of the challenges that uh, and we've heard from end customers uh, related to storage and OpenStack. Uh, I'll cover uh, some introduction uh, and some of the, the use cases that we are hearing. Uh, and then I'll turn it over to VNA to talk about some specific solutions that Scality has put in place in order to help solve those customer issues. Um, so first off, uh, touching on you know what what we're seeing from customers. We're, we're uh, we've been involved in uh, OpenStack since the Grizzly timeframe. That's when we uh, published our first uh, Cinder driver. Uh, we're, uh, and since then, we've expanded into a couple different areas that VNA will will dive into uh, with both Cinder, Swift, as well as some open source work. And as we discuss uh, with our customers that are interested in OpenStack, we're hearing. Uh, specific challenges that they're seeing as they move typically from an enterprise view of the world into the, the cloud view. Um, we'll then talk about uh, OpenStack and the Scality Ring, and VNA will spend most of his time there and wrap up with some Q&A. So first off, what, what are the challenges that, that real customers are having? Um, you know, think, think of an OpenStack deployment. They've got thousands of VMs uh, doing all types of jobs, and what we're hearing is that you know, only the the, the top uh, 15 or 20 percent of those VMs are actually doing what I would call tier one workloads. They they need that hot edge of storage that is either flash based or or typical uh, fiber array. The majority of other uh, VMs fall into that uh, tier two, tier three workload space where they have uh, IOPS requirements. Um, somewhere around the 150, 200 IOPS, uh, but definitely not uh, at the level of the tier one, tier two. Um, there are also uh, a significant number of different applications that they're trying to run, right? What are, what are the workloads? Are they running uh, email infrastructure? Are they running uh, various as a service for, for their internal businesses or external, uh, as well as uh, what is the, the type of data that needs to be stored? Uh, is it uh, you know, a typical object store, massive amounts of, of data that is, uh, you know, fits well into to an object you know, REST type interface, or is it actually legacy information, things that access data through file systems, and is it small or large? Are we talking gigabytes or terabytes? And all of this builds into what we're seeing from customers, especially standing up OpenStack, is uh, the movement towards petabyte scale storage. Um, and when you, when you actually move into that petabyte scale storage, cost becomes a significant factor. Uh, you know, standing, standing up uh, traditional arrays, you, you quickly drive uh, both capital expenses and operational expenses very high. Uh, and for many of the use cases, that 80% that I talked about, you don't actually need that level of performance. Uh, and uh, along with that, uh, you need to basically deal with you know, how, how durable and available is that data? Uh, you know, uh, from the enterprise world, you're, you're used to the traditional, you know, gold, silver, bronze type storage levels. As we move into the cloud, how do we, how do we put those storage policies in place that allow the, the customer either to purchase from, from you if you're an infrastructure or a solutions provider or internally in their cloud to say, you know, I'm willing to spend this much amount on storage. Uh, and my business units or my external customers will pay me this, and then that drives the overall business. You know, how much is, is a, a terabyte of data worth uh, to the business? So, you know, the, the big thing here is, and to keep in mind is, you know, while compute is hard, uh, scalable, reliable storage is much, much harder. You look at all the different solutions out on the floor, uh, lots of people are doing software-defined storage, but you also have the traditional storage vendors there as well. All of them you know, working to ensure that the, the data that's written to them is reliable, durable, and available. Um, so what do we do? Uh, you know, the world, from, from our view, is, is moving to these software-defined storage solutions. This is... Uh, 
you know, whether it's a virtual machine-based uh, cluster, it's physical devices, uh, it's appliances, the ability to quickly plug in more storage is, is becoming key as, uh, you know, uh, the, the internal infrastructure teams need to scale out for the new applications that their business customers are requesting. Uh, you know, everybody's well familiar with the fact that, uh, you know, with virtualization and uh, OpenStack, you can go from, you know, weeks in, uh, to get an application server up and running to, to hours or, or minutes, depending on your internal process. The, the same thing applies to storage. You want to be able to quickly scale out the consumption uh, of storage for a particular business or, or uh, use case. Um, the, and that sort of really ties into this storage agility uh, part of the story, which is uh, giving your customers what they want at a price they, they find attractive for the business and not having them or you worry about uh, you know, things that don't add value to how you run uh, your organization. You know, focus on the, the cool stuff, right? If you're, a, if you're a company selling a product, focus on new innovation rather than how do I make my infrastructure work? And that's where OpenStack, uh, and especially software-defined storage, adds a lot of value. So, so you know, today's approach, and it, it's shifting, but it's definitely well entrenched, is the, you know, the typical proprietary hardware story. Uh, you've got, uh, uh, arrays of some type, you know, pick, pick your favorite vendor, they're running uh, uh, iSCSI, they're running uh, NFS, they're running SAN. Uh, uh, m a lot of them uh, work best in a single site configuration as you start scaling out into uh, multi-site, into geo-distributed, you're running into uh, synchronization uh, and consistency problems. Um, really, these, these devices in, in the OpenStack world work well with that hot edge, that hot edge data requirements. You know, high throughput, low latency. Uh, is it flash, uh, flash devices in the physical servers? Is it, uh, uh, you know, high speed uh, interconnects? Uh, you know, the, this, this style of, of arrays uh, is really, you know, you rack something in, you, you drive a forklift in, you drop it in, you wire it up, you connect it either IP or, or SAN. Uh, and you run, and you've got awesome screaming performance, and that, that's perfect for that 20%. Um, uh, but when you uh, start looking at what you need uh, in the future, you've got that hot edge, uh, but you also have a capacity tier, and that, that tier two, tier three workload that really 80% of, of the uh, application workloads really run on. Um, so how do you deal with that? You've got, you've got a, a couple of ways of uh, uh, accessing it. A lot of legacy application are, are file-based, you know, you write into a directory, you're, you're using NFS mounts, uh, you know, things like, you know, uh, CAD CAM, uh, video, editing, all of these things. Um, you've got the new sort of world of object-based applications, REST, you know, that could be anything from a, a SaaS solution to uh, internal email. Uh, uh, there are lots of different ways that uh, REST is being consumed at this point. Uh, and then you have the VM-based application. So that, that's two aspects. Uh, the VMs could be uh, the actual images that are running, uh, but it's also, uh, you know, coming from a legacy model where the actual data is stored in the virtual machine itself, maybe as a separate volume, uh, all depending on what the internal architecture of the organization is. So what you need is, is or what we believe you need, is software-defined storage. So you have uh, uh, commodity uh, hardware, you know, this is, uh, you know, the typical vendors that are out there. Uh, you know, uh, compute uh, in order to power the storage, uh, f racked full of, of spinning and a couple uh, SSDs, and then using that the software-defined storage, that application layer, you're actually building a highly reliable and durable system. Um, and uh, from, from Scaly's perspective, uh, the, the real value and where all the world is going is the software-defined storage. Uh, as I mentioned, you walk around the show floor today, uh, there, there are tons of people providing software-defined storage solutions. Each has its own nuance and its own differentiation, uh, but it's clearly uh, a move uh, away from the traditional uh, big rack uh, of storage uh, or uh, you know, smaller scale, uh, super high speed devices. 
again, those are great for some workloads, but when you start looking at, uh, especially in OpenStack and how you start to scale out, uh, we feel software-defined storage is the way to go. <laughs> now, uh, you know, the, the question is why? Uh, and what, what we're seeing, uh, and this is uh, uh, something we found uh, through some analysis, is basically uh, software-defined storage allows you to scale. Um, uh, th this particular study is, is meant to look at, you know, as we add uh, more workload and more number of clients, how does the system respond? Uh, the, the green bar is your uh, response and latency time, uh, and the blue climbing uh, incline is the uh, uh, actions per second attempted, so the number of clients. Uh, the thing to notice is, depending on the, the particular uh, details of the workload, it, it, it scales roughly linearly, uh, depending on the number of nodes. And then here the interesting piece is that, uh, uh, that at some point you reach a resource saturation. So uh, let's say you've got six nodes providing a software-defined storage solution. At some point you just run out of the, the resources necessary to handle the number of clients that are connecting to you. Uh, and that's where we see this, uh, this drop off. And then all of a sudden, the latency goes all over the place. Uh, the ability to uh, respond to actions gets uh, super wobbly. Uh, and in the software-defined storage world, what this means is it's time to expand your, your solution. Do you add more uh, storage uh, so you can continue to, to climb at that linear rate? Um, of course, th there are, are real-world constraints on how far you can climb uh, on that curve, uh, but the things to note is that uh, until you hit some of the, the current physical limitations on size of S, uh, SSD, size of uh, spinners, as well as the number of compute nodes and uh, internode traffic, uh, the, the, the latency curve continues to stay flat as you add in uh, more physical servers. So. What, what does that mean for OpenStack? Um, so the, from our view, there are, there are basically two types of, of storage that are consumed in OpenStack. One is the ephemeral storage. Uh, now think about it as when you spin up a VM for a, a SaaS application. Uh, the, the VM that's running the actual SaaS app doesn't have any data in it, right? So it's an ephemeral instance. As soon as it disappears, the, the storage be below that disappears. Um, it's... Uh, uh, good for booting the VM, uh, it's good for uh, some of the operations and, uh, that are associated with that VM running, you know, uh, spooling logs before they go out to a, a collection system. Uh, but of course, this doesn't persist. Uh, and what that means is as soon as that instance goes away, that, that information goes away. So uh, that's where the persistent storage comes in, and that's uh, where we see two de types of storage. So you've got the block storage via Cinder, and typically for storing VMs, uh, you know, as, as everybody uh, uh, should be aware that Cinder is just an API for controlling storage as provided by somebody else. You know, there's uh, you know, Scality, of course, but NetApp, EMC, SolidFire, uh, all of the people out here providing software-defined storage and Cinder drivers, this is a control API. And the actual uh, uh, IOs talk to a, an end device that's provided by your storage provider. Um, and the other uh, type of storage that's uh, used is object storage, and that's via Swift. And uh, Swift is different in that it's actually a full stack, a, a full solution that uh, provides uh, REST-based storage. Uh, for those of you who sat in on some of the Swift talks uh, uh, this week, you know that they have you know, uh, error encoding coming, they do replication, they got zoning, everything you'd expect from a, a full product that typically you would have seen only through the, the storage vendors uh, that uh, uh, are providing Cinder-based drivers for their information. Um, so I, I think the key differentiation there is Cinder, you're actually talking to uh, a product, a vendor, and Swift, you're, you're running uh, you know, Sw the Swift software that uh, you can download for free or get supported by Swift Stack or one of the other people. Um, so. Uh, that's sort of a, a, at a high level what we're looking for uh, within OpenStack and storage. So how, how do we deal with that? What are the, what are the things that uh, uh, give us solutions that work uh, for Cinder and Swift? And this is, you know, uh, for the example of Scality where uh, we feel that the, the software-defined storage 
really makes a difference. Where um, you know you have a number of workloads. Uh, again, I, I want to reinforce that you know 80% of our workloads are not this high-end, uh, low-latency, high-throughput. Uh, you can access uh, storage through file, through object, through VMs. Uh, and the different types of protocols you can use are, are the standard ones, NFS, SIFS, uh, you know, whatever your object uh, flavor that you enjoy, you know, S3 slash uh, compatible, uh, Swift is there, CDMI, there are half a dozen custom ones as well. Uh, it all depends on what type of investment your business users uh, have made on their applications. Uh, and then at, at the bottom, you know, the, from a storage perspective, they don't care what, what OpenStack on the compute side runs, right? We're just providing a service. And you're able to scale that service in both locally or geo-dispersed based on the capabilities of the storage system. Um, and y you, you add more storage, your business is doing well, your, your business units are continuing to thrive, it's easy enough to scale out. You drop in some new servers with some uh, spinners and some SSDs, and you expanded from uh, one petabyte to two petabyte or beyond. So, uh, from Scality's perspective, we think that uh, uh, software-defined storage, as I said, is, is the way to go. Um, Scality itself, uh, we think, is a uh, obviously a great solution. Uh, I wouldn't be up here if uh, I didn't think that. Um, we, we're already compatible with Cinder and Swift. Uh, we made some announcements uh, earlier this week on our, our new Swift support. Uh, we've had Cinder in since Grizzly, and uh, VNA will talk a little bit about a new open source project that adds another type of Cinder uh, uh, solution into the uh, into the mix. Um, the the key for us is how how do you provide this storage? Uh, in a way that seamless integrates well with OpenStack and from our perspective also services some of the other needs that businesses have outside of the OpenStack arena. Um, so, uh, you know, I've, I've got a team of uh, four dedicated people that are developing uh, work for, so for Scality, that are involved in the, uh, the community around Cinder and Swift, doing code reviews. Uh, we, we feel that, you know, both from Scality's perspective, uh, where we obviously have a business value that we add, but also from a community perspective that OpenStack is really going to continue to disrupt what's happening within the uh, both uh, enterprise space as well as the service providers. So, so uh, what, uh, what I want to take away from here is basically you know, what does, what does Scality provide? And Scality, uh, in my mind, provides a few things, and I'll use Amazon terminology because most people are familiar with that. Uh, you know, we provide the equivalent of EBS. Uh, we provide uh, ephemeral uh, storage as well, uh, you know, the equivalent to the, uh, 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 you know, the boot and, and bring down of volumes. We provide a... Uh, equivalent of uh, S3 interface, uh, and that can be CDMI, it can be Swift, it can be uh, you know a, a, a S3 compatible API, and on top of that, we throw in some NAS for those legacy applications that are out there, um, allowing you to uh, basically service all the different needs of the applications that may want to move into an OpenStack en environment. Um, one of, one of the things that uh, uh, is very attractive about these software-defined storage solutions versus a, a, a legacy solution or one of the, the higher-end uh, solutions that uh, is good for the 20% of those uh, workloads is that we're able to, through uh, both uh, software uh, innovation as well as uh, the commodity hardware basis, uh, to get a very low cost per terabyte, uh, which is very important to the business as you look at how can you add value to your end customers? What, what does the business unit or the, the software app, uh, as a service application user really need to be charged when, uh, when they're using uh, a solution built on top of your infrastructure? Um, and of course, you know, all, all the great benefits of OpenStack are out there as well. Uh, you know, easy uh, automation, deployment, monitoring, uh, things that are you know, making this community grow uh, stronger and stronger. Um, uh, for the uh, for the last thing uh, I wanted to talk about, this is a, a interesting graph. Uh, it talks about how do you scale 
uh, VM workloads uh, across the I/O loads. And you know, one one thing that we're finding in software-defined storage, uh, and why we think it's great for the 80% is, you know, if if your workload is so intensive that it has a you know a few VMs that are hammering a, a storage device very hard, uh, you know thousands of uh, IOPS, uh, the, the benefits that you, you get from software-defined storage uh, become more challenging because you become I.O. bound. Uh, basically, how, how much I.O. can you push to a single storage device that's providing the, the backing for the VM? But as you look at uh, scalable software architectures, uh, you can add in multiple uh, types of access, multiple connectors, if you will, that allow you to service uh, you know, uh, you know, hundreds of VMs per uh, scalable storage unit uh, with an I a total IOPS load that is quite high, but the individual IOPS to a particular VM is in that 150-200 that range that I talked about. So you basically see a, a pretty nice uh, return on the cost of the the storage per terabyte, the number of virtual machines you can sp support per uh, software-defined storage instance, uh, as well as the, the lowered cost associated with managing software-defined storage versus a traditional uh, solution. Um, so with that, uh, I'll turn it over to VNA to talk more about the technical side, which, uh, you know, what we're doing in, in Cinder, Swift, and uh, the open source side. Okay, thank you. So uh, our first contribution so far is, um uh, Cinder backend. Um, so we are there since uh, Grizzly. Um, so it's uh, we offer uh, block storage, uh, enfin volume storage through uh, our distributed system. So uh, volume is nothing but uh, a sparse file stored on the ring. Um, so as you can see here, uh, this is uh, the Horizon uh, console in uh, GUI. Uh, showing um, a scality sparse file declared as a, as a volume. So here uh, you see this is um, a, a mount point on the ring, and here you see two volumes stored as a sparse file. So, and so you can grow a, a single volume as much as you can because it's a th basically thin provisioning here. Um, our, our second contribution is a Swift uh, plugin. So uh, here we don't change the, co the container and account management because we want to be uh, uh, nearly 100% compatible, especially with Keystone. Uh, and we simply um, uh, replace the object component. So we are behind the Swift proxy. Uh, so, so the only thing we don't support from natively from Swift is the storage policies for the objects. We do support it for, for containers, but for object we, are, we have our own uh, policy management. So you can decide to, to, to span the data on ma many rings or one ring stretch in many locations. Uh, we do have uh, erasure coding already in production from for uh, more than two years. Um, and al so the only al also the, the important thing is that you can store your VMs and your uh, application data in the same ring, if you want. So our so this is a quick example of a um, so a simple uh, uh, container creation through the Swift command line tool. So we put a file, and here we can download it from the directly from the ring. Our third contribution is. Um, so uh, a kernel block device. So we made an announcement yesterday. So it's open source. Uh, it can talk to any REST-based uh, uh, driver. So we think it's interesting, interesting for the community. Um, so for us, what's the need? So first, you can consume a very easily block uh, from a VM or uh, from any other application. So you have two kind of uh, application in, inside a VM. The ones that are able to talk uh, object uh, natively, so the, the best ones, and you have the, let's say, the leg legacy ones, uh, we, which needs a, a data volume. So you can use uh, the, the, the block device to quickly mount volumes and provision uh, volumes in your VMs. 
Uh, it's available for, for other uh, uh, OpenStack uh, products if, if they want to hack into it. Uh, otherwise, we have got a project to write another uh, Cinder backend, uh, which will talk directly to this interface. So we, you will access the same view volume through either the file system or the uh, kernel bug device. Yeah. So depending on what you want to do, uh, especially uh, you can uh, through the bug device you can enable uh, first uh, Linux caching, which is uh, very nice. And um, also, uh, you can plug in layers uh, with a device mapper, <coughs> such as flash cache or uh, uh, mirroring or whatever uh, uh, feature interesting features. So so far, uh, the three these three components uh, complements our vision uh, that we just described at the beginning of the presentation. Um, so the Cinder, the Swift, and uh, so the REST bug driver. So this is uh, for the future. I mean, it's available now, but the, the Cinder driver based upon the REST bug driver will be available in Kilo. Uh, where else? Uh, so who are we? So we are maybe you know, so uh, uh, founded in 2009, so 90, empl uh, 90 employees. We are based in France, uh, United States, and Japan, uh, and Europe. Uh, okay. So uh, that's, uh, that's sort of the, the quick run through of uh, what we're doing in, in Cinder and Swift. Um, I think that uh, uh, there are a couple unique features there that are interesting. One, I think the, the scalability REST block driver, I, th I think, is pretty exciting. It's, it's a block on the top, so what people are traditionally used to using, and, and rest out the bottom. Uh, because it's open source, uh, you know, people can extend it uh, however they want. You know, right now we've written a CDMI as an interface. Could be anything else. Uh, the architecture set up uh, to, to be uh, uh, expandable uh, uh, very easily. Uh, we're using it uh, specifically with uh, Los Alamos National Lab. They're, uh, uh, they've got uh, actually a virtual exabyte uh, GPFS volume running on top of a REST block driver pumping data through it, so it's a uh, massive scale, very good for HPC. Uh, and we, you know, there, there are half a dozen other great uses for something that uh, talks REST uh, out the bottom and uh, block out the top. Um, as VNA pointed out, the, the Swift uh, uh, interface that we have is that we're actually maintaining the, the core Swift code and just replacing the back end. And that ensures that as Swift matures uh, and changes and adds in new features, we'll work seamlessly. So there's uh, no playing catch up with APIs and, uh, and behaviors uh, because we're just acting as a target for the storage, the actual blob of data, all the other things that uh, Swift provides come for free. Uh, and then our Cinder drivers, uh, I think, are uh, quite good. The, as VNA pointed out, the, the one that's currently out there since Grizzly timeframe is based on sparse files. Uh, so people who are used to managing file systems know how to look at it and understand it. Uh, but from a Cinder perspective, it, it fits in just like any other driver that's out there. And uh, and we're looking forward in Kilo uh, to uh, to have the uh, a generic uh, scalability REST block driver available uh, for this uh, this new t uh, open source technology. So uh, with that, uh, we're uh, open to any questions. Uh, OK, uh, well, if no questions, well, oh, yeah, there is one there. Oh. No. No, actually, so the first version we we, Im we are implemented as a backend. You know, uh, there is a notion of a storage ba object controller. Uh, so we simply override the class. So it's a very clean integration. I mean, it's not. A we simply add new uh, method of of storing data, and we don't modify at all the code. Yeah, exactly. No, it's not upstream. It's just uh, on GitHub for now. And then if it is popular, we'll uh, try to 
to get it upstream. That's a good point. Yeah. Yep. The the block driver. Uh, so, um, so for, for for that you can use LVM on top of the kernel book driver, and you can do it. But for now we do we don't support that, except uh, in the block interface. Yep, we 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 need. So we we decided not to to touch this part. So is there any management involved in the scheduled product to manage the autonomous container servers? Because normally you need to manage them to the own tool. So what you do is so we have a pretty much standard installation where you you define your container ring. So gen generally we put them on the same controller nodes. So you know you have three uh, controller nodes, one a HA proxy, and we make a small ring on SSD with containers and accounts. And then we have the scheduling behind. Uh, so it's fast, fast enough. Uh, yeah, so we in scheduling we have replication and we have Azure coding. So we do support up to six copies of the data. Six copies when you do replication, and uh, when it is Azure coding, it's up to 64 parts. <laughs> so we can do uh, 10 plus 14 or whatever. So, so mo most people are doing what, 8, eight plus? Uh, 8 plus 4, four or? Right. Six, yeah. Unless you go to your distributed, and then they go up to a 10. Okay, well, if there are any other questions uh, you don't want to ask, uh, we've got our, our OpenStack team here. Come on down and uh, we'll answer them for you. Thanks, everybody. Thank you.